With all the rumors of a Bloodborne 2, but no official confirmations to quench the thirst of that Stockholm Syndrome, this video should hold all you Bloodborne sequel fiends over for a little while. From the perspective of a newcomer and a seasoned player, I'm going to rank all the Bloodborne bosses including the DLC from easiest to hardest. I won't include anything from Chalice Dungeons as I haven't personally completed them. Flame me in the comments and I'll come back at you like a goddamn spider monkey. Anyways, a lot of the Chalice Dungeon bosses are copies of the main game and some are just plain silly. Before we dive in as usual, don't forget to make sure you're subscribed and notified for future videos. Number 22. Witches of Hemwick. The witches are elderly hags who make a living by gouging out the eyes of the folk of Hemwick, a district of Yarnum. They use the eyes they've collected to conduct rituals, granting them arcane magic. During the nights, they summon paranormal monsters called the Mad Ones to gather the eyes of the dead and living for the witches to obtain. Even though the witches are fairly simple, on a first playthrough it was such a cool atmosphere. The gimmick is that the witches can teleport and become invisible once the fight starts, and they even sometimes hit you with a spoon-looking thing. Regardless, charged heavy attacks into backstabs make quick work of them, and with the right runes to do visceral damage, you'll be just fine. There are some additional enemies to avoid that they can conjure, but you can wipe them out before even dealing with them if you attempt the boss fight later on in a playthrough. Number 21. The Celestial Emissaries. Possibly the Healing Church's most successful experiment in a long line of failures. In the early days of the Healing Church, the Great Ones were linked to the ocean. In an attempt to make contact with the Great Ones, patients would imbibe great quantities of water. Without even a lofty goal of communicating with Great Ones, these patients would simply listen with heads bound and eyes covered, awaiting the howl of the sea and the unfathomable, unspeakable utterings of the Great Ones. The fluids they ingested writhed inside their heads, the initial makings of internal eyes. These patients would imbibe so much water that it would cause their heads to expand. The process was seemingly agonizing. Patients found in the research halls begged to be put out of their misery, believing that they must have done something horribly wrong to be subjected to such a fate. Most of these experiments would end in death, the corpses then cast into acidic poison pools at the foot of the stairs to be dissolved, and the whole process begun again on fresh patients. The main challenge with Celestial Emissaries is getting slapped around by the giant one once he appears. If you run around in a circle while chipping away at the smaller blue boys, you can queue up phase two, pop a blood pellet, and wreak havoc on that dude's ankles. If you make it here later in the game, it should be a relatively easier fight with adequate weapons, gems, and upgrade levels, but they do tower over Witches of Hemwick with a larger health pool and more enemies. Number 20, Bloodstarved Beasts. A remnant of the fate that befell Old Yarnum. Its body is made up of old sinew and muscle. Any skin is tightly stretched. Affixed to its scalp is a long, fleshy-looking cloth-like substance that appears to have been burned on as it travels along with the beast's movements, even when it jerks its head violently. At first glance, this cloth resembles the head coverings that the lesser female beast patients of Old Yarnum wear. This resemblance may indicate the Bloodstarved Beast was once female. Bloodstarved Beast on a first playthrough is very tricky because of poison and some of the attacks being a bit harder to read at times. Those flaps do be flapping harder than a flappy bird and she definitely uses that to her advantage. Because you can get reasonable parries and sneaky backstabs, there's some flexibility in this fight for visceral damage instead of chipping down the health bar slowly. A veteran player will typically use Beast Blood Cocktails, an item that attracts various enemies and even a few boss fights into their location, and from there proceed to violate this Flapjack Supreme with repeated backstabs and transform attacks on the Sock Cleaver. Number 19, Parl. Dark Beasts are undead beasts. They hide in their surroundings by blue sparks. Irreverent Izzy and Archibald, the infamous eccentric, both studied Dark Beasts. The Dark Beasts of Bloodborne are differentiated from other beasts by their ability to generate electricity, or bolt, from their hides and being in nature undead. Parl is discovered lying, as if dead, in the graveyard of the Dark Beast, located at the entrance to Yahar Ghul from Old Yarnum. Parl will drop the Spark Hunter Badge when defeated. Spark Hunter Badges were crafted in secret by Archibald, the infamous eccentric of the Healing Church, for his friends, implying some connection to Parl. Archibald and his inventions were unpopular among his peers. Despite crafting what has become regarded as a masterpiece, the Tenetris, meaning thunders in Latin. I bet some people didn't know this fun fact. Parl is indeed another boss like Bloodstarved Beast that is attracted to the Beast Blood cocktails, 
though they don't seem to help on him nearly as much as the Bloodstar Beast, especially in early game. I had never known this until playing the game for a couple of years. Parl is best defeated by limb staggering him into a full kill combo. Without using this, you might notice that even randomly you will end up breaking limbs without even trying to as you chip away, leaving multiple opportunities to get more damage. Number 18, Cleric Beasts. The Cleric Beast is a huge creature with hideous, twisted horns, matted fur, and a malnourished figure, emitting shrieks that sound like cries of agony. Although at first glance, the Cleric Beast appears to have emaciated and almost a skeletal body, this monster has high agility, supernatural strength, and a sizable amount of health. It's one of the first bosses encountered in the game, and the first boss to be revealed during the game's development. Ironically, even though a Cleric Beast can be fought as the first boss of the game, it's kind of tricky early on. You can gain a lot of leverage as a new player by stocking up on Molotovs throughout Central Yarnum and purchase even more and just spam them until he dies. But if you fail to succeed the first time, you'll be left with a broken dream and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Cleric's attack strings of combos can chain or continue sometimes, ending in giant hand slams and a variety of other attacks at its disposal. While it doesn't have an incredible amount of health, you probably won't be attempting it with a heavily upgraded weapon. So some players may even claim it's harder than Father Gascoigne, the official first boss required to beat the game. A later game build can rip through the beast in a few hits, but it's arguably way more fun early on. Number 17, Rom the Vacuous Spider. Akin or brethren to the Great Ones of the Cosmos, Rom's large gray rock-like head is marked with dull, seemingly sightless eyes that stare in all directions and a small mouth round filled with sharp teeth. Rom's body is overgrown with fluorescent flowers and additional dark eye-like shapes. Evidence indicates that Rom was the result of an experiment conducted at Bergenworth. Rom's body is the main area of interest, as her head is very durable, and she tries to back away, making your attacks land on her face rather than her side. If you can get into a position to pull it off, there's a very satisfying combo to kill her in the beginning of Phase 2, but most of us have to grind it out the old school way. The smaller spiders surrounding Rom also share the trait of insanely durable heads, but squishy bodies. The most impressive thing is the way they program the AI. When running through the group of small spiders, you will notice that they can slip out of your range just slightly, and then plan group attacks with dive bombs, spewing liquid, and spamming arm attacks. Number 16, Murgo's Wet Nurse. Residing in a Lunarium atop the larger Nightmare Cathedral, a great one who inhabits the Nightmare of Menzis. There is no written or spoken lore about Murgo's Wet Nurse, and any conclusions about the entity known as Murgo's Wet Nurse must be drawn from contextual and circumstantial evidence. When the player approaches Wet Nurse's Lunarium for the first time, they are able to hear the sound of a baby's cry emanating from the pram in the center of the circular area. Upon approaching the pram, Murgo's Wet Nurse will drop down from the sky and stoop over to cover the pram with its wings. Next, it reveals several blades that resemble the burial blade and proceeds to initiate combat against the player character. While the Wet Nurse is the official last boss to beat in the game and get credits technically, it's much easier than some previous mentions. The only detail allowing Nurse to place higher up in the roster is Nightmare Phase. Experienced players will have the advantage of knowing how to Nightmare Cancel, where you dodge at the perfect time upon the Nightmare Beginning, which shuts it down completely. If this is your first time through, get ready for some Ring Around the Rosie. Number 15. Amygdala. Amygdala is considered a Great One boss in Bloodborne, and is found in the Nightmare Frontier. It's similar to the large enemies who attempt to grab the Hunter with portals, but lighter in color and lacks the tentacles on its head. Amygdala is a major threat early on, picking you up, stepping on you, and many other things that giant creatures with hands and arms do to puny manlets. Behind all the flash is the true fact that its head is just a giant ass walnut and you can crack it open for victory. Sounds pretty crazy, but hey, See for yourself. Number 14. Amelia. The current hunt begins, Amelia being the current vicar. She has watched Lawrence and all the previous vicars turn into beasts, though she doesn't know why, and now she's watching all those around her turning into beasts. She believes it has something to do with willpower and hopes that the old blood will save her. Hence that her prayer at the Grand Cathedral, our thirst for blood satiates us, soothes our fears, seek the old blood but beware of the frailty of men. Their wills are weak, minds are young. 
Amelia was tricky to rank on this tier list because without the use of blood pellets, fire paper, and ultra instinct timing, she's actually a lot different. Challenge runners and glitchless speedrunners usually use a full combo on her, similar to Rom and Parl. But let's forget about that right now. Even with a respectable weapon and upgrade level upon reaching Amelia, she can straight up heal. So aside from grabs, backpedaling, biting, and spamming the floor like she's trying to start a goddamn campfire, you probably want Numbing Mist. Numbing Mist can be found in Cathedral Ward and helps with the heal. Number 13, Father Gascoigne. A hunter of beasts operating in and around the city of Yarnum. In the world of Bloodborne, Father is a title used for clerics in a foreign land, and there's no such rank in the healing church, yet Father Gascoigne clearly goes by that title. This may be because he came to Yarnum from a foreign land, like the player character, and perhaps as a patient seeking treatment, or a religious acolyte following the scent of miracles. Papa G, not to be confused with Top G, although I guess he does have a top hat. All right, we'll call him the Top G for now. Breathe a bait, you don't need air. Papa G bolsters a crazy move set that has a lot of diversity and a lot to overwhelm a player that's new to the game. And I've even heard of people saying they gave up on playing Bloodborne altogether once they got to this point. Number 12, One Reborn. As told through the descriptions of the bell items, we know that the bells originated in the underground Thumerian labyrinth and were capable of reaching into other worlds and summoning beings from them. Although humans require insight to use these bells, it's likely that the bell maidens that summon the One Reborn are Thumerians allied with the church, like the church servants and the church giants. It's at the point of this theory that the bells used to summon the One Reborn are no different, and that the bell maidens in the One Reborn's arena ring their bells repeatedly to bring beings from other worlds simultaneously, coalescing all of them into one horrible amalgamation in the process of their summoning. The purpose of this would be to prevent hunters such as the player from interfering with Mikalash and Menzis plots involving the Menzis ritual and the Nightmare of Menzis. After all, they're unlikely aware that the scholars have undergone the stillbirth of their brains and to the best of their knowledge are still plumbing in the nightmare for answers from a higher plane. Wow, who knew a pile of legs, arms, and fleshy human doodads would have an actual backstory? It seems Miyazaki always delivers no matter how weird. And weird is a great word to describe fighting one reborn. The arena and the flow of combat is structured similar to Tower Knight from Demon Souls, where you run around a second story balcony taking out additional enemies while the boss spams projectiles and tries to slap you through the walls. Take out those witches that give the one reborn its power and you have an easier fight on your hands. If you really want the most damage, you gotta spam the head and torso sprouting out of the mass. The theme of full comboing a boss's health bar is relevant with this as well. So it definitely can be made much easier. Number 11, Mikalash. A student of the school of Menzis, appearing to have played an integral role in the ritual used to beckon the moon and make contact with Murgo. He can be found wandering the halls of Murgo's loft within the nightmare amidst many rows of dusty tomes and bloodless corpses, muttering to himself as if lost in an unending stream of thought. Mikalash's title, host of the nightmare, appears to refer to his role in the Menzis ritual. In the waking world, his mummified corpse is found sitting beneath a pool of moonlight, slumped forward in a chair and surrounded by what appears to be the mummified members of the School of Menzis. If the Menzis cages atop their heads were used to channel moonlight, facilitating contact with the Great Ones of the Dream, as the description suggests, then it seems likely that Mikalash was the focal point of which the moonlight was channeled, and that it was through his hosting that Menzis gained access to the nightmare. Perhaps this is mere speculation, but Mikalash is the reason that the lecture building is adrift in the nightmare, acting as a bridge between the waking world and the nightmare dreamlands. Mikalash's seemingly key role in the ritual may be why he's the only scholar who retained his mental faculties after the ritual is conducted. The other scholars of Menzis all seem to have lost their minds, along with their lives, in the result of the ritual, gaining audience with Murgo, and Mikalash is a sole exception to this. The boss fight requires a different kind of patience, one that lets you chase this guy all over the spooky tower of discount skeletons and vape clouds. If you can hang in there till the end, you're met with tentacles that can delete you faster than speedrunners can save quit in Dark Souls. Mm. The biggest attack in his moveset is Call Beyond, which is very simple to dodge with enough practice. But if you aren't precise, he will decimate you. There really isn't many tricks to make this a cakewalk other than poisoning Mikalash, but this requires to have him fall through the hole in the floor just before the mirror at the top of the tower. 
Otherwise, upon being poisoned, he will change locations. This requires some luck, as he usually goes to the mirror or the room. The odds are you won't be able to poison him first try. Number 10. Living Failures. The people you see as blobs in the research halls are mostly people who are in the progress of transitioning to emissaries so that mankind can communicate with the Great Ones. They failed horribly, and the hunters in the church need to atone for their sins they committed in that dark lab. Which is why it's there in the nightmare to forever remind them. While still a failure, they can command slight aspects of higher powers when together, and minor things when alone. The flowers are mostly there to grant peace. Apparently, they calm the creatures somewhat and were used as a form of therapy in hopes of keeping the emissaries sane during their process of ascension. This is all pure speculation, though, and based on a few dialogues. Living failures are like if you took the Celestial Emissaries and gave them the talent of NBA players like in Space Jam, increasing their size and strength, but unfortunately they are big dum-dums. They have some tricks that can beat you down quickly, like calling upon cosmic asteroids to ruin that perfectly nice garden. Wait, that's actually a pretty good question. Does magic even kill plants? Is that possible? Okay, this is a really good topic for another video. Anyways, the method that proves easiest is killing enough of them quickly to have one always respawning beside you and using it to kill off the rest of the health bar without moving from a corner of the arena. Alternatively, you can poison them and run in circles, but that's spookier to me than just fighting them legit. Number nine, the Shadows of Yarna. The Shadow's proximity to the Thumerian Queen gives meaning to their name, remaining as close to her as her own shadow. The blood rune gives some insight into their purpose. As servants of the queen, they yearn for her blood, but with little hope of receiving it. The shadows encountered in the Forbidden Woods appear to have resided there for some time, as each of them is infected with parasitic snakes that infest the woods and undergo gruesome mutations. They share a symbiotic link with the vipers, either transforming their arms to use them as whips or summoning gigantic serpents to devour victims. Upon reaching shadows on a first playthrough, you may notice that it's the only boss aside from Ruin Sentinels from Dark Souls 2 that is actually a triple boss fight, with all the enemies resembling each other. There is a slight difference, however, that each one wields different abilities. One with a sword, another with a sword and the candle, and the last one with pyromancies. The pyromancer also holds a weapon similar to a discharged tenetris. They can complement each other similar to Ornstein and Smo in the original Dark Souls, switching out positions on attacks and aiming to trap you in a flurry of fireballs, sword slashes, and in the second phase, stretchy arm attacks from the sword wielders. To top it off, a giant serpent will be summoned temporarily that covers a large area. While the shadows are great fun and can be taken down with not too much of a struggle on the first playthrough, they become extremely tricky in a damageless and speedrunning context. When attempted without hits, you will be best off taking out the shadow with the sword first, the pyromancer second, and the candle last to decrease the stretchy armor lunges, all while having the quickest DPS on the transition phase, as the pyromancer has less health than the others. The final shadow will backstep if you hit him with a delay, allowing a loop that leads straight to victory. On a speedrun, you must be speedy, so while there can be more ideal orderings in the kill depending on RNG, you just go in like a madman and spam them down while trying to avoid any big combos that may trap you and one-shot you. This was known to be a boss that causes a lot of resets, especially on the speedrun side of things. Oh, that sucks. Number 8. Martyr Logarius. Logarius was the leader of a secretive band of fanatical warriors known as the Executioners. Like the Hunters under German and the Healing Church Hunters, the Executioners under Logarius honed their craft in their dedicated workshop, a secretive enclave of mythical beliefs and heady fantasism that served as the backbone of their unique brand of justice. Their badge was shaped like the breaking wheel they used to cleanse heretics, called the Logarius Wheel. A weapon blessed with rare Thumerian blood magic by their leader who represented the Righteous Destiny. The symbol of the Executioner Covenant is the Gold Ardeo, a conical gold helmet which to them represents luminosity, ambition, and an unflagging resolve to face impurity. The Ardeo in this case could be a reference to the Latin word burning passion, or to be in turmoil or love, meanings that are very in line with the emotional and fanatical beliefs and behavior of the Executioners. Martyr Logarius has arcane magic that can make it hard at times to access him keeping a front line of defense and allowing him to backpedal, set up to hit you with his weapon, and even fly. Out of flying, he can spinning dive bomb you, and that's great for backstabs, but very tricky to evade quick enough. 
Simply catching up to the guy and landing hits becomes a more delicate system than other fights on this list. He's kind of a mid-game boss, seeing as you need the Kanehurst summons to access the castle, meaning that if you attempt him as early as you possibly can, you may struggle. He's typically killed much later in challenge runs like Hitless, because it makes the total amount of engagement so much less, leaving no room for sneaky magic or missing backstabs. Number 7. Gurman, the First Hunter. Gurman is a kindly old man whom you'll first meet upon awakening in the Hunter's Dream. He is the workshop's founder and the very first hunter, though due to his advanced age he now only serves as an advisor. As such, he has a wealth of experience and will provide you with wisdom and guidance throughout your exploration of Yarnum. Gurman was also associates with Lawrence and Willem back in the college days of Bergenworth. Gurman's weapon, the Burial Blade, his attire, and his style of combat were all deeply influential to the hunters of the Healing Church until Ludwig took the hunter's style of combat in a new direction. I personally believe that if Clint Eastwood was in an action RPG fantasy game, he'd probably have a fake leg, a scythe, and trick you into thinking he's the good guy. Have any of you seen German and Clint Eastwood in the same room? Hmm. German has extremely fast attacks, that combo for big damage, and a phase transition with a mini spirit bomb. Once he's in his final phase, he'll do an area of effect attack that literally affects almost the entire arena. This alone made it so hard to beat him at base level the first time I tried a level 4 run. Parries are an option, but with often trading, meaning you'll take damage or die at the same time as he goes into the stagger, they can be quite risky without enough health. Fighting him normally, on the other hand, genuinely requires you to try harder than a lot of the previous fights on this list. Back all of that up with a sizable health bar, and German is still a challenge even for me and I've done it damageless. One time I somehow got him to fall out of the arena with full health and die, but it was so lucky I was never able to recreate it, and very few people even have heard of this. Number 6. Moon Presence The Moon Presence is a nameless great one in the world of Bloodborne, a being synonymous with the Blood Moon, Pale Blood, and the likely source of the Hunter's Dream. Its actions are the primary instigator and driving force behind many of the events and situations that have arisen in Yarnum and throughout that world's history. When it's seen descending in the Hunter's Dream, it appears at the same time that the Blood Moon becomes visible, indicating that when the Blood Moon descends, so does the Moon Presence. However, its physical form actually descends from the Moon, indicating that it's a separate entity, that the Blood Moon is simply a place in which it lives, which it seems to exercise control over. Interestingly, the Blood Moon does not appear to be in space, but rather in our atmosphere, so low to the ground that the clouds are able to pass in front and behind it. The Moon Presence is perhaps then a manifestation of the Moon, a physical form for an abstract idea. If the Xenomorph from Alien had an apex predator, it would certainly be this bundle of Moon Spaghetti. It has an attack that literally decreases your health to 1 HP, and guess what? On a damageless or hitless run, you have to kill it before it lands that attack on you. That alone is incredibly frustrating to learn, and still poses a challenge for me to this day. This is also assuming the character that you have is set up well, possibly even maxed out on gems, upgrades, and approaching a character level of 70 to 80. The movement of Moon Presence does a really good job of masking the attacks to newer players so well that I was still getting slapped around by the same animations because I always thought he was running rather than attacking. Number 5. Ebrietis, Daughter of the Cosmos. Ebrietis is a left-behind Great One who inhabits the Altar of Despair at the back of the Grand Cathedral in Yarnum. Ebrietis is a Great One from the Land of Ease, a place located in the Chalice Dungeons Labyrinth. According to the Choir, the Land of Ease lies in contact with the Cosmos, which allowed the Great Ones who resided there to function on transcendental planes of thought. The Augur of Ebrietis suggests that the Church was able to use phantasms, which are slug-like invertebrates, known to be augurs of the Great Ones, to partially summon Ebrietis. Let's address the elephant in the room real quick. Who the hell came up with this design? Seems like it was discovered after some lucid fever dream of Monday's meatball dinner going bad in the fridge and becoming sentient. I love the music and the atmosphere in this fight, but it definitely gets aggravating trying to dodge the charge attacks and continuously getting slapped by that baby arm on her back as she passes by. Not to mention attempting to run away from the lasers, but being straight up stuck on a rock or a wall. It's almost like the arena is huge, but at the same time, not enough, unless you get really accurate. There's somewhat of a combo that can be done on this fight the last time I had ran Bloodborne, but it's trickier than most previous mentions. Number 4. Ludwig the Accursed. 
Ludwig was the first hunter of the church, known as the Holy Blade, and a man emulating the heroes from an age of honor and chivalry. We do not know of Ludwig prior to his role as the first hunter of the healing church. It may be that he was a scholar at Bergenworth, or perhaps a hunter under German. German certainly knows of Ludwig, mentioning him by name in his dialogue. The first hunters under German focused on engaging beasts with speed, based upon the fighting style of their instructor. This focus on speed and dexterity meant that weapons like the Burial Blade, Blades of Mercy, and Rakuya were favored by those who engaged in the hunt. Now that we're entering the top tier of the list, some of these bosses can be subjectively more harder for some than others, but what's going to set this apart is my perspective of having completed them with zero damage taken and having to learn every single attack and an answer for virtually every situation. Luckily with Ludwig, if you practice a bit and go for Leg Stagger in the first phase, you can sneak in the timing for a transform attack at a rolling to hit his back legs and quickly get his HP to phase 2. This is where things usually trip up a ton of people because his attacks are so weird, and with the sheer size of the Moonlight Greatsword, also projectiles, you need good planning and positioning ahead of time. I like to just run around his body close up as I find it avoids a lot, but again, with good upgrades and beast blood pellets you can cripple him easier than the next few bosses in the tier list. Number 3. Lady Maria. She is a distant descendant of Annalise, Queen of the Vile Bloods, and wields the Rikuyo. Maria fought with great dexterity, relying on skill rather than the blood blades of the Canehurst nobles. With the honing of her skill over the blood arts, this is possibly what drew her to German in the first place. Maria became a student of German and one of the first hunters. Maria is such a good humanoid fight, and to me, is almost equal with the enjoyment of German. I know the fanboys will most likely cancel me for that claim, but hey, after getting your ass beat over and over again, the game changes you. There's no strategy I know of to kill Lady Maria fast or in a cheesy fashion, but with enough practice you should be able to backstab her on super weird angles by making her attacks miss you, and it's one of the most satisfying moments in the entire game. It's unlikely most will learn this before beating her the first time, so for those on a first playthrough, Godspeed. Parries can be a great alternative and safer to learn at a distance, but when close, watch out for the delayed fire and blood effects surrounding the attacks. Number 2. Orphan of Koss Koss, a great one whose carcass was found washed up on the coast of an apparently isolated fishing hamlet. If the player looks closely, they can see that Koss has a very humanoid face, with long tendrils where hair should be. This might explain why Koss's Orphan is so humanoid in appearance to begin with. Though there's not much backstory to be told with Orphan, as he's just been birthed as you arrive, the gameplay will most definitely speak for itself. Orphan, the Kingpin, the GOAT, is my favorite boss in the entire game by far. And he also would have won the top spot for the hardest boss in the tier list. Unfortunately though, there's a glitch, and it makes him a big dum-dum if done right. Outside of that glitch, the fight teaches you spacing and timing like no other. Even when you're knocked down on the ground, his weapon can still damage you, but since it retracts and extends, you have to be planned out with every recovery. On phase two, you'll be required to allow Orphan to take the lead of the fight. He will go into, at first glance, what will seem like an unending flurry of attacks that will allow you to only have tiny moments where he gets fatigued and continues to chase. Number one, Lawrence. Lawrence was the first vicar of the Healing Church and played an instrumental role in its founding. Before the Healing Church existed, Lawrence was a student at Bergenworth, an institute of learning where scholars studied the history and archaeology under the guidance of Master Willem. Willem was delusioned by the limits of human intellect and looked into the Great Ones, beings that might be described as gods who existed on higher planes for guidance, emulating them. Willem hoped to elevate his being and thoughts to those of a Great One, though how mankind was to do this was never determined. For any of you politically correct people out there, here's some fun information. I believe Lawrence has the largest moveset of any boss in Souls, period. Something close to 50 individual attacks that can happen. Of course, a lot of them may look similar, but across the series, there's not many that go as hard as Lit Larry. That's my new nickname for him, by the way. If anyone knows of a boss that has more attacks than Lawrence, please comment below. A large variety of attacks is one thing, but it's how Lawrence controls the space that makes it scary to land attacks. He also has one of the weirder shaped character models. You can think of him as Cleric Beast that went into the hyperbolic time chamber and came out a specimen. Even when the dude's legs fall off, he's still super scary. Actually, I'd argue because of the exploit allowing you to loop the slam on phase one, that phase two is harder, no matter experienced or not. 
I've seen him rob record times on speedruns, kill 3 plus hour zero hit runs of my own and others as well, and he reminds us that even though FromSoft reuses boss designs from time to time, he is one of the few done right. I would really enjoy to see what you guys think about this order of the tier list. I know some of you may have used tricks or builds I'm not familiar with, so if anything is stupid easy that I claim difficult, please comment what it is below. Also, if you're waiting for Bloodborne 2, what do you want to see changed in the sequel? Thank you so much for making it to the end of this monster tier list. Make sure to subscribe and be notified for future content, and check out the links in the pinned comment for live streams, Instagram, the Discord, and the Twitter. See you in the next one.